get our new series in Moses, which is going to be incredible. I want to make sure that we have some backstory, because if there's any story that people who maybe aren't even Christians or didn't go to church on a regular basis probably understand a little bit of the story of Moses because of famous movies and, and even cartoons. And so as we go into this story, I want to make sure that we understand how did we get to this element, this story in Exodus. But also, as we're moving through the story, I want to remind us, and I'll do this throughout today's message, and I'll do it all the way through the whole series, that as we're learning the story, we're going to put ourselves in the story. But remember, we cannot see ourselves as one of the people in the story. You and I are not Moses. You're not Moses' mom. You're not the midwives. You're, we're not the people in the story who, if they are given specific promises, that we can claim those promises as if those were for us. We want to always make sure that we set the tone as we go through these stories because we will be learning some life lessons along the way as we see who is God, the character of God, how God interacts with people. So we want to make sure that we understand that. Now, how do we get to Exodus? We have to know the lineage. I want to give you a brief lineage of Moses. Abraham, many of us know Father Abraham, had many sons, and one of the sons was Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob, God turns his name into Israel. You're wondering where we get the name Israel, the nation of Israel. Jacob, God said, your name will now be Israel. Jacob had 12 sons. It is from these 12 sons that we get the 12 tribes of Israel. The nation of Israel comes from these 12 kids of Jacob. And Levi is one of the sons of the, one of the 12 sons. And Moses is the great grandson of Levi. Well, how do we get to where we are in Egypt? One of the 12 sons, if you remember the story, is Joseph. Joseph is sold into slavery by his other brothers. He follows God, and, and God uh, sees fit that even though he gets sold into slavery in Egypt, he becomes and works his way up following the Lord. He becomes second in charge of all of Egypt. Only the Pharaoh is more in charge and more powerful than Joseph, which means that Joseph is number two in pretty much the known world. A famine hits the land. All of the brothers, the other 11 tribes, they move to Egypt where Joseph is second in charge. And there they begin having kids and there they set up their camps. There they set up their communities and they live there for hundreds of years. Well, sooner or later, as all things happen, people die. The Pharaoh who loved Joseph, he dies. Joseph dies. And when we pick up the story now, the new Pharaoh, the new king of Egypt does not know who they are. He was not a friend of Joseph. And this king looks out and he begins to see these Hebrews, these Jewish people, the nation of Israel, they're getting more and more kids. They've got a lot of boys running around here. And if they ever wanted to join forces with someone else or even have an insurrection here, they may be able to overtake us and so he pulls his leaders together and he says, we need to start killing the boys. Why the boys? Because the boys are the ones who grow up to be soldiers and warriors. We need to get rid of them so these Hebrews, this nation of Israel, can never, never overtake us. And so he wants to begin killing the boys. This is where we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, 
the first whose name was Sypha, and the second whose name was Pua, when you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. If the child is a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. Verse 17. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. We'll come back to that part of the story. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this and let the boys live? The midwives said to the Pharaoh, the Hebrew women, they're not like the Egyptian women for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. Verse 20, so God was good to the midwives and the people multiplied and became very numerous. Since the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Now listen, in all of these stories, we can't read too much into this simple little phrase, but we do know that God was pleased and they, that they did not follow Pharaoh's rules. We'll come back to that too. Verse 22, Pharaoh then commanded all his people, you must throw every son born to the Hebrews into the Nile, but let every daughter live. So do you understand the setting of what is happening? The nation of Israel's in Egypt. They're becoming too numerous, too many war boy, boys that could be warriors, so they're going to start killing off the boys. And so we need to understand what is happening to God's people in Egypt under this Pharaoh and understand what is happening when Moses enters the story. Again, we want to learn these principles. We're going to see how God interacts with people. We're going to see that God's character does not change. We're going to learn some principles, not only today, but all the way through this story that you and I can apply the truth. We can apply the principles to how we are living our life. This is an incredible story. There's a reason why a lot of movies are made about this story. So you got the setting, right? Now let's go to Exodus chapter 2. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. Remember, Levi, great, uh, is, he's one of the 12 sons. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son, Jacbed, which is Moses' mom. It's not here in this story, but in other areas of the Bible, we're given her name. Jacbed is the mom. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When the Bible says here he's a fine child, it's not that she looked at him and was like, oh, he's wonderful. Every mom thinks that. She literally looked and thought, this is a healthy young boy. He can survive. He can really make it through. He has all of his limbs. He is healthy. He is beautiful. He is fine. And I'm absolutely not throwing him in the Nile. And so she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it, watch this, among the reeds, we'll come back to that, along the bank of the Nile. His sister, her name is Miriam, we know that from other passages, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. We're gonna come back to this, but I want you to understand the story. Moses is born, he's a healthy child, he will survive, he will thrive. We don't want to kill him, so we're not going to pay attention to Pharaoh. We're going to go against the rules of the land. We're going to save our child. We're going to hide him. But after three months, what are babies really doing? They're crying. They can be heard. And so she now knows that she must do something different than trying to hide him. From how the story is told, we can imagine and see that over those three months, Jacbed, Moses' mom, she's noticing that Pharaoh's daughter comes to this area of the Nile and amongst the reeds here, this is where she takes her bath and her attendants come down with her and she's there on a regular basis. She begins to plot. She begins to have a prayerful plan and we're gonna come back to that in a second. Verse five, then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, Miriam, Pharaoh, then his sister asked, I'm sorry, then his sister, which is Miriam, asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew 
women to nurse the baby for you. And you see the prayerful plan beginning to work. You see, Moses' mom, Jacques, she didn't just take Moses and like, well, it's three months, he's crying, I hope God does something, put him in a basket and throw him in the Nile. She's been watching. She's been watching that Pharaoh's daughter comes down and bathes right here in the reeds. So she not only sticks him in the reeds, which means the basket's not going to flow away, but also she puts him in the reeds and tells Moses' sisters, Miriam, you go down there and you watch. And if Pharaoh's daughter opens the basket and sees a baby that you are right there hey would you like for me to help you with this Hebrew baby that you have seen maybe I can go and find someone to take care of it for you yes go she answered so the girl Moses' sister went and got the baby's mother Jacques Pharaoh's daughter said to her take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. That's incredible. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, that's Moses, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Again, this is an incredible story. And at this point in the story, we can learn some lessons because even before Moses does anything, we see what is happening We can learn lessons from Moses' life as we invest ourselves in the story. We can begin to see how God moves. We can see lessons about good and evil. And absolutely, we can see some lessons here. And this is great because we're getting ready to get back into school. I know private schools have already started. Home schools have already started. Everybody in public school, everybody will be in school this week. And so there's some great parenting tips There's some great parenting lessons here that we see from Moses' mom and dad and the family that we can absolutely apply to our life because this is an incredible happening. This is an incredible happening where, so uh, Moses' mom, Jacques, she takes and says, Miriam, I want you to stand right there. And when his daughter chooses not to kill him, gives us the opportunity, you spring into action. And then you take Moses, the baby, to his mom, Jacques and then all of a sudden we see what God is doing as she says, will you nurse him and I'll even pay you. This is an incredible story of God's sovereignty. This is an incredible story of how we can interact with the flow and the story of God. So let's look at a few life lessons from this early in the story. The first one is this. Even in hard times, God is always in control. Now, some of you may say, well, that, that seems simple. It is simple. It is a rule of life that you and I, if we're Christians, this will help us navigate every challenge in our life, that we are understanding that when times are hard, God is still in control. He is still right there with us. So it is simple, but listen, friends, it is not simplistic. And I want to make sure that we understand you need to put this into the rules of your life, how you function in the world. Because as many of us know this story, we need to step into the story Look away from the basket and look other places around the Nile. Do you know what you see in the Nile River in this story? If you take another view of it, you see other baby boys drowning. Jacques says, I'm going to hide and put in a basket. Other parents fearful for their life. They don't want to die. And so they're taking their boys and throwing them in the river and they are drowning. The Bible says that they weeped and they cried out to the Lord in this whole story. And so these are difficult times. When our kids are growing up and and little kids church, we don't tell that aspect of the story, but let's do some adulting here. This is a hard time in the nation of Israel. These are God's people. And we got the story of one baby who makes it. Others of them have been drowning. There's weeping and wailing along the Nile. But in the midst of all of those difficult times, we must see that God is in control. And only God 
who has a plan. And so long before Moses is in Pharaoh's house, long before he stands before the burning bush, when he's just a baby, God has a plan. And God is sovereign and he is in control. And so you and I, maybe as parents, as we're getting ready to send our kids off, maybe your youngest kid's going to school for the first time. Or maybe you're like us, taking your kid and they're now starting college for the first time. Wherever you may be in your parenting, but really wherever you are in your life, as you traverse through the journey of life, if you will take this biblical truth, insert it into your heart and understand no matter what happens, God is always in control. Simple, but not simplistic. And it will absolutely change how you journey in life. It'll change how you do things. This must be where you start. That's a great life lesson, even in hard times. God is in control. Second lesson, God is always in control and the choices you make matter. You see, this is the continual tension between God's sovereignty, which means he's all powerful, he's all knowing, and our responsibility in our world. And there's a tension. And I will tell you this, any theologian, any Bible teacher who tells you, oh, we got it all figured out, know exactly how it works. No, they don't. They don't. Because it's a, it's a tension. And it goes back and forth. And both are completely true. God is sovereign and in control, and our choices matter. It's full-hearted faith. I mean, I have faith that God's in control and God is doing this. It's full-hearted faith with careful, prayerful planning. And we need to understand that they go hand in hand. And only a foolish person will try to put one over the other. We must live out our life this way. There's an old military saying that became very famous in the Revolutionary War, which is this. Hey, soldiers, hey, guys, trust in God and keep your powder dry. Trust in God and keep your powder dry, meaning be ready to fight, be ready to shoot, but we're putting our trust in God. Again, when you go back to the story, Moses' mom has hid him, but she prayerfully and I would say very shrewdly has a plan, putting Moses in the reeds, This is when Pharaoh's daughter comes down. Miriam, you stand right there. Jacques, you be ready. If Moses is able to be taken to you, you're going to nurse him. They threw in the bonus, so you're going to get paid for it. But there's a prayerful planning that is going on. Again, don't read in the story that she just was all tearful and cried and stuck Moses in a basket and, well, there you go. I hope something happens to you. There he goes, down the river. No. No. She had prayerfully planned. She knew that there would be a way for this to happen while completely understanding the sovereignty and the trusting of God. Again, a lot of parenting things going on, right? We all know this to be true. If you have a test in school, listen, I've tried it. I've tried not studying, showing up on Friday, whispering this sovereign God, you are all powerful prayer. Lord, you know I'm a good person. I read my Bible this week. I talked to good people about you, but I ain't studied a bit. So Lord, I'm not even asking for an A. If you can just give me a C, because you know in college, C's get degrees. If you can just give me a C. And if I have done no studying, you can trust and put your hope in a sovereign God. You fail in the test. We understand that, right? We understand this whole idea. Those of us looking for jobs. People, I want a job. I want to work. Well, have you got a resume? No, 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 no. I'm just trusting the Lord. Did you go put your resume? No, I'm just trusting the Lord. Have you asked anybody? Have you told anybody that you need a job? Have you gone out looking for a job? No, no, man. I'm just sitting right here playing video games, praying and hoping that God leads me. God's good. He's faithful. He's sovereign. You got to get a resume and you got to go. They're both working hand in hand. Ministries here in our church, again, highlighting Miss Stacy with the younger kids, Clint with the kids, Seth with the middle scores, Brad with the high scores. Incredible ministries are happening. Incredible things like our taking the uh, the stuff to the the, uh, schools. All that is great. 
And you know what God needs to happen? Needs to have people to serve in student ministry. This band is incredible. They're all volunteers. If you would like to serve in our band, we need people to always be signing up and auditioning. Why? Because we have a sovereign God who loves worship, but those drums don't play by themselves. You see how it works back and forth. There's this, this continual tension. I've had some people who just started coming to Team Church see the Nexus signs, and they talked to me and asked me about Nexus. The same thing works. We know we need more room. We see we're a growing church. We know we have tons of kids, and we're praying that God does miraculous things. We're praying to the sovereign God that he would do incredible things among us. And at the end of the day, it's going to take people sacrificially giving to Nexus for us to hit our goal and build the building. Do you see the tension? You have to see that in the story, and you and I must live this tension in our own life. God is always in control, but the choices that we make absolutely matter. Talked about this last week. As we get involved as Christians in our community through policies and things that are happening, we pray, we know God's in it, but we have responsibility for our actions. We are responsible for our actions and consequences will be there even though there's an all-powerful, all-knowing God. Saw this in Technicolor last week. We live out in the country now. So out in the country, we have a, a septic tank. Well, we started noticing that there was an alarm going off. Eh, 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 eh which means the septic tank is full. I went over, pulled the lid up. Sure enough, it is full. So I call Mike McGirt. Mike's been coming here forever. He's a great plumber. If you ever need any plumbing stuff, you got to call Mike McGirt. I called Mike. I said, hey, can you come out? He said, yeah, I can come out. Make a long story short, the pump in the bottom of the septic tank needed to be replaced. And so he's doing that, and I'm helping him out. Not really. I'm just watching him because I know nothing about anything like that. So I'm just watching He's doing everything. He's all ready to go. We fired up. Pump works, but it's really full. So I said, hey, I said, you know, down about 20 yards, the one pipe goes out. There's a cap. I can actually remove that cap. If I do that, it'll drain faster, right? We live out in the woods. So he's just going out in the woods. I was like, he's like, it'll absolutely drain faster. I said, we'll do that. He turns off the pump. I said, well, I'll go down there and remove the cap. He goes, you may, you may not want to do that. Because I said, no, I said, the pump, I said, it's, it was only on for like, what, 30 seconds, maybe a minute? And it's like 30 yards kind of uphill. I, 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 I know you know plumbing. I know you're a god of plumbers. But I'm going to go and get this thing done quickly. I like to move fast. So I went over there, and I bent down. I got the cap. I popped that sucker off. <laughs> I'm completely drenched in all of the Hibbard mess. <laughs> Absolutely got in my mouth and my teeth. It's just true. Landry Kate come out. I was like, come give me a kiss. Didn't do that. So I looked at Mike. <laughs> he goes, I told you. I had the consequences of doing what I wanted to do, even though there was an all-sovereign, all-knowing Mike who said, if you pull the cap, things are going to happen. You know why? Because his sovereignty, all his knowledge did not keep me from making my own problem <laughs> and doing all of that. Does that make sense? This is the tension. God is always in control. He knows how the sewer of your life works. But the choices you make matter, absolutely matter. Speaking of choices that we make, because I think there's a lot of things here for parents. So those of you who are not parents yet, or you're done parenting, give me a little bit of time here. We're going to take a, a parenting timeout and walk through this. A parenting timeout, because planning and preparing is never more important than when you're pushing your kids and they're going off to school. When, they're, when you're, they're doing things and you're not around, we need to be prayerfully planning, correct? And one of the old adages and sayings is, prepare the child for the road and not the road for the child. Yes, but that's not a full, complete, good principle. Let me give you one that I believe is much better. When kids are younger, prepare the roads that you can. 
When your kids are younger, you absolutely get out in front of them and you prepare the road. Do you know why? That's your responsibility. You get out in front of them because they're not smart enough yet, they're not old enough yet, and you are to prepare the path of life for them. We absolutely see Jacques doing this, preparing. She comes down, she bathes in the reeds. Miriam, you're getting there. Prepare the path for your younger kids. This is your job, this is your role, while also preparing your growing kids for all roads ahead. So what is the parenting timeout tip? When your kids are younger, you absolutely get out and you prepare the path. And I will tell you this, because ministries are getting ready to kick back in, however old your kids are, you need to make sure you jump in front of them and you clear out the busy schedule. You make sure, and this is going to sting for some of you, you make sure that the path in front of your kid coming up this fall isn't all about sports and being in the right sport and academics. You are in charge. You clear out the schedule. You prioritize the schedule to make sure that you're clearing out the path, not only spiritually, but you're in charge of making sure that kids too young don't have phones. You're in charge of making sure that people, are, the kids that are a little bit growing, there's things that they're protecting them from. That is your job. Prepare the path when they're younger. And then this next part, which is part of the other one, is absolutely begin to prepare the person for every path or every road that they will face and you are not there. They both work hand in glove. This is how we are preparing our kids. Our our, uh, younger son has been at school with sports all summer. He's already there, but we went yesterday for Fan Fest and all the freshmen are coming in and all the parents are there. If those parents have not prepared their kids for the roads ahead, there's going to be some challenges. If the parent was always clear in the path, now there's going to be a challenge. So you got to do both. And I would tell you this, when it comes spiritually, now you're going to prepare, as your kids are getting older, the spiritual life so that when they leave your home, the spiritual life doesn't leave. They have become spiritual people. That is the meaning of that. We are to do both. Because parents, at some point, you're going to let your kid go. At some point, you're going to put them in the river of life. And it is our responsibility to clear the path early and then prepare the person later so that they can move forward. Next lesson that we learn here. Christians are to obey God as our ultimate authority. The Bible teaches there's a time to submit and there's a time to resist. The midwives, the Bible is very clear. Pharaoh said, do this. Midwives said, no. uh, Moses, your mom and dad said, kill your son, throw him in the river. They said, no, there's a time to submit and there is a time to resist. There is not a blanket teaching. We'll just stick with the New Testament. There is not a blanket teaching in the New Testament that as Christians, we just submit to all authority around us. Now people will say, oh, Kenny, Have you ever read Romans chapter 13? And people will claim that this is a direct teaching from Paul that we must do whatever the government says because he says there in in Romans chapter 13 that all governments have been placed there by, by God. You must understand that most of the New Testament when Paul's writing it, he's writing it from prison because he didn't do what the government said to do. So we must understand the context and the backstory of Romans 13. Paul is making sure that this new church in Rome understands the nature of this government. God understands it too. He sees it there. Matter of fact, he says in Romans chapter 12, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If possible, you live at peace. And if you're here, you pay your taxes. If you're here, you obey the rules that are set up there. Unless the rules, what they tell you to do, goes against God's authority. God's rules, and we must understand this. Too many people, knee-jerk reaction, to take one verse of chapter 13, totally out of context, not understanding the context, not understanding the backstory, and understanding that Paul many times was going against what he was told to do. The early Christians went against what they were told to do. Peter, 
in Acts chapter 5, he's getting out of prison and he's going to go back to preach. Verse 28, didn't we strictly order you not to teach in this name? Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than people. So yeah, we just got out of prison. If you want to put us back in prison, we'll do that. But there are some things that we're not going to do even though you're the authority because our ultimate authority is God. For some of us, our ultimate authority is popularity of culture, what everyone else is doing. And so we must understand we have the authority of God first. And this is how the early Christians, I mentioned this a little bit last week, this is how the early Christians changed the world from the inside out. The early Christians showed the Roman world the relevance of their faith by showing the positive, good results in their personal lives, but also in their families, that when we follow Jesus' way, when we follow what Paul and James and Peter have instructed to us by the Holy Spirit, when we follow Jesus' way, our lives are different. We can now be seen by people, and it's a positive thing. The early church in Galatia, in Ephesus, in Rome, in Corinth, the early church had no political power to abolish slavery. So they purchased slaves and then freed them with their own money. They could not stop unwanted babies from being aborted or abandoned, so they rescued them and then took them into their homes. The early church gathered on Sundays, and as the church, they began to treat all races, all ethnicities, all economic stratas the same. They stood opposed to sin and offered forgiveness in a better way. They did not accept sin and the, or compromise truth. This enabled them to look and be different. And people, over time, saw that it worked. And communities changed. Rome changed. Things began to happen because people saw that these crazy Christians... They're not listening to the government and killing babies. They're not listening to the government with other things. They're doing these positive things, which cost them, and now people were attracted to the positivity of the Christians and their lives. The problem today, the problem today is many Christians, many Christian families, and too many Christian churches look just like the world. And when we look just like the world, we're not different. No one is motivated to change. When our lives look no different, when our house on the cul-de-sac looks no different with how we spend our time, how we spend our money, what we do with our passions and our gifts and really the, uh, the outflow of maybe some morality, the things that are happening, when it doesn't look any different, then no one gravitates to the Christian way and therefore no one really is being changed by watching us, the New Testament Christians changed every city they were in by living out the truth, even at their own cost. And over time, people are like, that's a good way to live. They seem to have really good marriages. Man, those kids really seem to, those communities really seem to. Did you see that family? They, and people begin to change. Christians are to obey God as our ultimate authority, trusting in the sovereignty of God, as we're making our choices and prayerfully planning, then we will begin to see our lives, our community lives changed. And like back in the story, now God is going to use that. Our last lesson is this. Hard times do not negate God's concern and care for us. Again, we love this story, but the Israelites are hurting. And think about it. We read the story and we're like, oh, Moses is a baby. He's in the reeds. And then the mom nurses him. And then he goes to Pharaoh's house. And then pretty soon he gets to calling. Da, da, da. By the time Moses comes back to free the people, 80 years. 80 years. That's a lot of dead little boys. That's a lot of broken families. That's a lot of, we're going to see, whips and the Israelites being slaves. We read through these stories sometimes and they're so happy, happy, happy. And we're like, wow, step into the story. Look away from the basket. 
Look away from Pharaoh's house. Look around. These are hard times. But even in hard times, God's care and his concern does not waver. You can't see sometimes, I've been there, you've been there, God is in control. But what you can do when you don't see things happening the way you want it to happen, what you can do is continue to trust. What you can do is continue to obey. What you can do is begin to ask God to prayerfully lead you and guide you as he is moving. Then looking back, we can go, you know, I don't like everything about it. And it was hard times. I see how God always was caring for me. I see how God was always loving me, even though I didn't like everything that was happening. Have you ever felt the warm embrace of God's care in the middle of devastation? We can't explain it, but we know it's there. Now, yes, consequences for actions are there, but not all, to our, not all hard times are direct results of sin or consequence. It's just not. Good situation in Egypt went really bad and stayed bad for a long, long time. But God's love and concern did not waver. Now listen, as we come here into this whole series, I can't promise you that your Moses Day deliverance is coming, that we can read through this story and just like Moses, whatever is going on in your life, you just give it to God and he's going to handle it just the way you want it. That worked, for the most part, for Moses. But you ain't Moses, and I'm not Moses. The principle is for all of us. God's care, his love, never changes. And friends, we can rest in that. We need to know that no matter what is happening, when you get the phone call today, when the doctor's report does not come back, when things you really wanted to happen for maybe your kids or your job or whatever it is, just didn't happen, didn't go that way. God's love for you did not change. And even though there is maybe a tear in your eye, there's hope in your heart. Why? Because you know God's in control. God loves me. He's concerned about me. He can handle anything I need according to his will. And you're like, yeah, that, can't, that doesn't really preach real well. Like, that doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy. I don't want to go buy that book. Don't go buy that book. Just buy the Bible. Because the Bible depicts a story of God's people moving forward in angst, but also in worship. It shows us a story that God is in control and that he's going to deliver his people in the midst of and through the storms and hard times and his love does not go up and down. His care does not go up and down. We can count on him. And again, maybe you haven't been there. If not, you will be there. But in the midst of crying, in the midst of the pain, you can understand, if you understand these truths, that God is for you, he loves you, and he is absolutely moving in your life if you will allow him to do that. We can cling to these promises, not because they happened to Moses specifically, because that's the character of God. That's what it means to be in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That we have this power and this love and this grace that no matter what is happening, we are never left alone. We are never left without his love. And we can absolutely experience that love that peace that passes all understanding. Remember, that phrase doesn't mean that you don't understand it. It passes all the understandings of the world. And you understand that in the midst of this, I have this peace because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. I'm a Christian. The world doesn't understand it. 
The philosophies of the world does not understand and agree, but here I am, a Christian, and literally chaos is all around me, and I can feel the comfort and the love of Christ. Look into the story, friends. That's the story of Moses. That's the story of all of us, if we will allow it to be. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are here for us, that you know us, that the cries of our hearts do not go unheard. God, I pray for those who are parents and, and we're releasing our kids. They're going, doing different things. We trust in your sovereignty, but God, help us to be wise in our prayerful planning. Help us to prepare the path when needed. And then absolutely, as they get older, prepare the person. God, as we go through this story of Moses, help us not to just see the story as seen specifically, but to look around and know that this is not just the story of Moses, but it's a story of your people. It's a story of your grace and your truth and your love. We ask it in your name. Thank you.